In this next section, Toxicology 1, we will discuss some common side effects seen in drug toxicities. In this section, we'll talk about some of the common side effects of many medications, as well as uh, common portions. An important concept to remember whenever prescribing medication for, to a patient is that that medication can have beneficial effects, but also have adverse effects. Adverse drug effects can work in many ways. First of all, they can be extensions of the expected action. For example, barbiturates, which are sedative hypnotic medications, can actually cause respiratory depression as an extension of their general action. Also, beta blockers, which are, which are known to decrease heart rate, can cause actual bradycardia and AB block, which can cause morbidity and mortality to patients. The older the patient is, the more likely they are to have adverse drug effects. Therefore, in geriatric populations, we usually have the dose of most medications that we give younger people. Some drug effects are dose dependent and some are dose independent, meaning the more drug you give to that patient, the more likely they are to have the drug effect. Dose independent effects are not related to the dose. Some drug effects are idiosyncratic, for example, chloramphenicol causing aplastic anemia. We don't know exactly how they work. These are the questions that are normally asked on the boards to see if you can memorize all of the drug effects. Um, we will go over a lot of these in the review. It's important that you understand the concept of therapeutic index like we talked about. The therapeutic index is the ratio of the lethal dose to the effective dose. And you'd like this to be as high as possible. That means that the drug is safer. Some drug toxicities are related to pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics. Uh, two important enzymes that are different from person to person include pseudocholinesterase and glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase, or G6PD. Pseudocholinesterase, also known as butyl cholinesterase, can be deficient in certain people. Uh, those patients that take succinylcholine will not be able to break it down as quickly as patients that have a normal functioning pseudocholinesterase. This can cause prolonged sedation and, and anesthesia. Patients that have G6PD deficiency, when they take certain medications, such as the following, can develop hemolytic anemia. This is a microscope slide showing bite cells that are present in a patient that has G6PD uh, after being exposed to an oxidant drug, such as those that I mentioned. The inset shows Heinz bodies, which are globin uh, collections that their liver will bite out, and that's why these patients develop the bite cells, also known as schistocytes. These are blister cells that are present in drug-related hemolysis. Drug-related hemolytic anemia is also a common side effect, and we will talk more about that. Another example of genetically determined drug toxicity is hepatic porphyria, that is a defect in uh, heme synthesis pathways. Um, other inducers, um, such as phenobarbital, can stimulate the heme synthesis pathway. This can lead to a toxic intermediate uh, accumulation and cause hepatic disease. It's important to know the classic causes of coma, meiosis, midriasis, arrhythmias, hyperthermia, metabolic acidosis, both GAP and non-GAP, and hepatic failure. These are commonly tested on USMLE. When you see a patient that's either on the test or in, in your uh, future career that has a coma, the most important things to remember are you should think about which medications the patient might have taken. You should think about central nervous system depressions, such as alcohols, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, and opiates, as well as recreational drugs such as GHB, gamma hydroxybutyrate. For constricted pupils, you should think about for example, the organophosphates, which are cholinesterase inhibitors, and opiates. Meperidine is the one opiate which sometimes has an antimuscarinic effect and can cause dilated pupils. For dilated pupils, you should think of amphetamines and cocaine, phenothiazine antipsychotics like thorazine or chlorpromazine or prochlorperazine. Tricyclic antidepressants can also cause dilated pupils. Cardiac arrhythmias, ironically, the medications that you are more likely to see arrhythmias in 
are, are uh, patients that are receiving antiarrhythmics in the first place. Also, patients that are receiving sympathomimetics, such as uh, um, amphetamines, digoxin, uh, phenothiazine antipsychotics, like we talked about, and tricyclic antidepressants. Um, specifically, a long QT syndrome uh, is a, a disease that is very dangerous. Uh, QT intervals are prolonged by multiple situations and medications. Um, medications such as amiodarone uh, that block cardiac repolarization can prolong the QT. Anything that causes hypokalemia can prolong the QT on the EKG. And some patients actually have a hereditary prolonged QT syndrome. Uh, this is also known as Ward-Romano syndrome, and it results from mutations in either the sodium or potassium channels. Long QT syndrome is dangerous because it can progress to torsad the point. Uh, and the reason is because the longer the QT interval is, the more likely there is to be an ectopic beat within that QT interval. If the QT interval is short, there is less of a chance that an ectopic beat will take place during that time. And if an ectopic beat does take place, meaning an R happening on top of the T, you have R on T phenomenon. An R on T, which is basically an ectopic early beat on top of the T wave, is known to cause torsades. As you can see in this patient, we have a P wave, we have a QRS complex, and a T wave. P wave, QRS, T. Here we have a QRS with the notes P wave, and here we have a T wave. And in this T wave, we have a premature beat here, a QRS happening on top of a T. This is R on T phenomenon causing torsade to point. Other medications that are associated with uh, QT prolongation including, include the class 1 and class 3 antiarrhythmics, quinidine, as well as amiodarone and sotalol. Sotalol is both a beta blocker and a potassium channel blocker. It's, class, it's considered a class 3 antiarrhythmic. We will talk more about that in the cardiac section. Also, chlorpro chlorpromazine as well as thioridazine. And uh, a, a, a medication that was thought to be a um, replacement for Benadryl or diphenhydramine, Seldane, was actually removed from the market because it prolonged the QT to a high degree. Uh, it was replaced by a medication, fexofenadine, which did not prolong the QT interval. Hyperthermia. A patient comes into the emergency room and they have a very high um, temperature. Uh, in terms of toxicology, the most important things to think about are ecstasy, also known as MDMA or methylene dioxine methamphetamine. These patients often exhibit high fevers and are very thirsty. Uh, other medications that patients can overdose on uh, that would cause hyperthermia would be anticholinergic medications such as atropine. Patients also will develop anion gap metabolic acidosis. There's a mnemonic called mud piles that is very convenient for remembering the causes of anion gap metabolic acidosis. The most common causes include methanol to toxicity, uremia, diabetic ketoacidosis, peraldehyde toxicity. Uh, this is less commonly seen today now that we have benzodiazepines, which are re relatively safe. Uh, isopropyl alcohol, which is less common. Lactic acidosis, which is very common. Ethylene glycol and salicylic acid. It's important to remember how to calculate an anion gap, and it's very simple. As long as you are able to draw up a chem panel on the patient, the point is to avoid the potassium, just cross it right out, because normally potassium is not an important anion. Uh, the sodium is 145, and you multiply, I'm sorry, you subtract the chloride, which is 100, plus the bicarb and that gives you an anion gap of 23. What's a normal anion gap? A normal anion gap is anyone, anything between 8 and 12. So this patient has an anion gap. What does that mean, an anion gap? Anion gap means that there is something in there that's creating a gap between the negative charges and the positive charges that you're seeing in the normal blood chemistry. And what those negative charges are is usually some type of a drug, 
or some type of anion that the body is producing that it's not able to get rid of properly. So the anion gap can be very telling if you have a patient that has a low pH. So along with this, you would expect in this patient to draw blood gas that would tell you with regard to hepatic failure, the most common cause of drug-induced liver failure is acetaminophen or Tylenol toxicity. Alcohol also is a major cause of liver failure, especially in patients that are over the age of 40. In terms of acetaminophen overdose, hepatic failure occurs because of the consumption of the normal metabolic pathway and the alternative and the initiation of an alternative metabolic pathway of acetaminophen. Remember, N-acetylcysteine is the antidote for acetaminophen overdose. This is also known as mucamist. It's a reducing agent. It contains a lot of sulfhydryl groups, which are able to uh, generate uh, uh, reducing agents. This is an acetaminophen nomogram. And what you see here on the x-axis is time, or hours post-ingestion of the Tylenol. And in the y-axis, you have acetaminophen concentration in the plasma. What you do is you ask the patient, how long ago did you take the Tylenol? If they say four hours ago is when I took it, then you can extrapolate up. And if their plasma concentration falls below this line, you do not treat, DNT, do not treat. If their plasma level is above the solid line, then you treat them. And you treat them with mucomist, with an N-acetylcysteine. If the patient says that at four hours post-ingestion, uh, if, their, if their blood level is 300, as you can see right here, you would treat them. If their blood level is 30, you would not treat them. Toxicity of Coumadin-type anticoagulants are, is, is a very important uh, topic and is something that you'll run across in your practice for sure. Uh, Coumadin works by inhibiting vitamin K. And remember that vitamin K is responsible for the production of clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, as well as the anticoagulant proteins, protein C and protein S. These are procoagulant, these are anticoagulant, but they're all vitamin K dependent. If a patient has a very high INR, which is also known as a PT, because they've been taking too much Coumadin, you have to assess the patient. And if the patient has some type of a bleed, it's very important that you reverse that INR PT by giving FFP, fresh frozen plasma, which will replete the patient of the clotting factors that they've been missing. If the patient does not have any bleeding, you can give vitamin K. Uh, vitamin K will work more slowly, uh, and it will lower the INR or the PT uh, back into the therapeutic range. But it's very important that you assess the patient to see if they're in imminent danger of developing a bleed or not. If they have a history of bleeding, I would give them fresh frozen plasma. If they appear to be stable, they don't have a bleed, and their INR is not too high, then you can give vitamin K. It's important to remember that uh, Coumadin and Warfarin is also found in rat poison. And remember that there are super warfarins that are present in rat poisoning that have very long half-lives. Heparin is another anticoagulant. Uh, it works by enhancing antithrombin-3, which inhibits thrombin. Uh, heparin overdose can be reversed with protamine sulfate. Remember that protamine is a chemical antagonist that binds heparin and prevents it from binding antithrombin-3. But in general, Heparin has a very short half-life, so therefore simply waiting in a patient that's received too much heparin will allow the heparin level to decrease. Benzodiazepines are sedative hypnotics that we use uh, for sleep aids as well as for uh, flight sedation. It's important to remember that the specific antidote for benzodiazepine poisoning is flumazenil. It works on the GABA A receptor as well, and it blocks the benzodiazepine from binding. It's a GABA A antagonist.
Carbon monoxide is another common toxin that the patients are exposed to, especially during fire. Um, the most important thing for patients that have carbon monoxide poisoning is to remove them from the exposure. Uh, the most important treatment is oxygen for these patients. Remember that carbon monoxide dissociates very slowly from hemoglobin. So it may take time for the oxygen to take the place of the carbon monoxide. For cyanide poisoning, remember that the way cyanide works is it blocks the electron transport chain that's essential for cellular respiration, meaning the ability to use oxygen. The classic lab finding is in these patients is to do an arterial uh, blood gas and to do a venous blood gas. And what you'll see in these patients is that they're not using oxygen. Their arterial oxygen will be 100, and their venous oxygen will be 100. And you'll say, why are they not using any oxygen? Why is the oxygen going from the arteries, arteries directly to the veins? It's because the cyanide is preventing the use of the oxygen. The antidotes for cyanide poisoning are the nitrites and the sodium thiosulfate molecules. These are able to scavenge the cyanide um, out of the body. Digitalis toxicity uh, is something that's becoming less common because we're using uh, digoxin and digitalis less commonly these days uh, for cardiac arrhythmias and congestive heart failure. It, is, it does still occur, however, and it's very important that you understand how to treat digitalis toxicity. It manifests usually as nausea, vomiting, mental status changes, and arrhythmias in general. Uh, there is an antidote to digitalis. Uh, it's called digifab or digoxin-specific FAB, which is an antibody fragment that binds digoxin and removes it from the body. Because digoxin binds very strongly to plasma proteins, it cannot be dialyzed, meaning the patient cannot undergo hemodialysis to remove the digoxin molecule. So therefore, you have to analyze the patient and de decide whether they need the digifab, the digoxin um, FAB, or if you can simply wait for the digoxin levels to come down uh, if they appear stable. Ethylene glycol and methanol are very common toxins that are usually seen in the emergency room or the intensive care unit uh, when patients overdose on them. Uh, ethylene glycol is found in antifreeze. Methanol is found in certain solvents such as windshield washer fluid and wood alcohol. Ethylene glycol is metabolized to oxalate or oxalic acid, which causes kidney problems whereas methanol is metabolized to formic acid, which is able to cause blindness. Uh, the antidotes for ethylene glycol and methanol uh, generally is considered to be ethanol. You can give the patient drinking alcohol or ethanol, which will take these molecules, the ethylene glycol and the methanol, away from the metabolizing enzymes, the alcohol dehydrogenase and the aldehyde dehydrogenase, and prevent the formation of the toxic metabolites. There's another medication that's newer, it's called formepazole or 4-methylpyrazole, that works by inhibiting alcohol dehydrogenase and prevents the conversion of ethylene glycol and methanol to the more toxic metabolites. Formepazole is very expensive. In general, we try to give patients ethanol in order to uh, get them over the uh, intoxication. This diagram shows how ethanol is converted to acetaldehyde and to acetate, which are safe molecules. But if you were to substitute ethanol with methanol, instead of acetate, you develop formate or formic acid, which is toxic. And as you can see here, methanol is converted to formic acid or formate. and ethylene glycol is converted to oxalate, which is toxic as well. Isopropanol poisoning is very uncommon and usually is not that serious. Isopropanol is found in rubbing alcohol. It can cause GI distress, but it's usually not as toxic because isopropanol is metabolized to acetone. Acetone, however, is a ketone and it can cause ketoacidosis. Lead poisoning used to be a very common disease. It's becoming less common these days as we uh, stray away from using uh, lead in products in our home. Uh, possible sources of exposure for lead poisoning include lead paint, uh, lead gasoline, 
uh, retained bullets in patients that have had a, a gunshot wound in the past or leaded glazes on ceramics. Uh, lead poisoning can cause a variety of adverse effects. Uh, it can interfere with the synthesis of heme, which can cause hematologic problems. It can cause basophilic stippling of erythrocytes and anemia. Uh, patients with, that have lead poisoning also will have uh, neurologic problems, including wrist drop. Um, in children that have uh, lead poisoning, sometimes they'll just have a patient with abdominal pain, and that'll be their only presenting symptom. And it can also cause a renal failure. This is an example of a patient that ingested paint chips, and you can see the uh, paint chips as radio-opaque marks in the digestive tract. Uh, lead poisoning can also cause lead lines to form, and you can see the lead lines here in the distal radius in the, and the uh, ulna. And this is because of uh, fast uptake of lead in that area. Um, and this is an example of basophilic stippling in an erythrocyte the uh, blue dots that represent uh, damage to the uh, erythrocyte because of defective heme synthesis. Uh, to treat lead poisoning, the most important thing and thing to remember for the test is to remove the patient from the source of the exposure. It seems obvious, but remember that. Um, the next important thing is that you can give the patient chelation therapy. And it's to be determined whether the patient needs to stay in the hospital or can go home. Um, patients can receive succimer, or DMSA, dimercaptosuccinic acid, uh, in the outpatient setting. Uh, if the patient is in the hospital setting and they're very ill, usually we'll give EDTA, and this is given IV. Uh, we can also give uh, penicillamine and dimercaprol. But in general, it's thought that succimer is the most uh, uh, successful medication for these patients. Uh, mercury poisoning. Uh, it's very important to remember that uh, organic mercury, that is methyl mercury, is more dangerous than inorganic mercury. Inorganic mercury is what we have in uh, thermometers. Methylmercury is what's found in fish. It's mercury that's been organified and is from an organic setting. Mercury toxicity uh, can cause multiple problems, including neurologic problems from pulmonary fibrosis and metabolic problems. Uh, mercury level is usually the only way to diagnose mercury poisoning. Uh, this is a patient who uh, injected himself uh, with mercury in an attempt to commit suicide. And you can see how the mercury has infiltrated the pulmonary vasculature uh, it's radio-opaque, and it forms sort of a uh, snow, snowflake appearance. Uh, this patient actually did survive this. And this is because the mercury that he injected himself with was inorganic, so it's less toxic. Treatment is obviously remove the source of exposure, and the, uh, the chelation therapy would be dimercaprol or succimer. Uh, the way these medications work is by binding the mercury and bring, bringing it out of the system. Uh, iron overdose is actually pretty common poisoning in children. Uh, the classic presentation of iron overdose in children is a child who's been eating too many iron pills or uh, Flintstones vitamins that contain um, iron in them. And classically, these patients will develop a GI bleed, hemorrhagic gastritis, with vomiting and bl bloody diarrhea. Uh, you may be able to do an x-ray and see the pills in the stomach. Uh, it's very important to remember that the, key, the common chelator that is used is deferoxamine. That binds iron and is able to bring it out of the system. A newer iron chelator is deferoporone, also known as X-Jade. Uh, it's much more expensive, uh, but it works better, um, and it can be used for chronic iron overload, especially people that have like thalassemias. You can see here on X-ray of a patient who uh, overdosed on iron tablets, uh, the accumulation of iron tablets in the stomach. This ends toxicology one. In the next section, Toxicology 2, we'll discuss some more specific side effects of medications.